Noh and for, for the introduction. I also want to thank um, Professor No and Professor Yuan Su Kim um, for your continuing friendship and support that includes my participation in this series, which has been four consecutive years by now. And my subject today is about a certain taste in French cinematic modernism that has been incubated at uh, the Institut Francais in Seoul. So you now know that you will have to excuse um, my French as well as my English. If taste hierarchy can allude to a matter of cinephilia, French cinema invokes a particularly ritualized memory in a generation of Korean cineasts. The words French movies preserve an emblematic past that discerns a certain intellectual and artistic pleasure often manifested in idiosyncratic, elitist, as well as counterintuitive and resistant fashion. It refers to a timeless taste, a home of cinephilia, especially in the pre-democratization era. As the seasoned Korean film critic Jung yoon Su has observed, and I quote, it was such an obvious and legible phenomenon that many of those film professionals that have been canonized as great in Korean cinema once shared the passion for French movies shown at the Institut Francais in Seoul. Kim's article was one of the many attempts to reminisce about this collective experience and historicize a practice that has been hugely influential in shaping a nation's cinema culture. A glance at every now and then interviews about the period as recalled by Korean filmmakers aged at least over 50 would easily reveal the prevalence and importance of the, of the experience at the Institute in their youth. This phenomenon raises important questions about nation and cinephilia. Why did the fidelity to French national cinema come to mean so much in the movie-going scene in Korea? And what historical circumstances allowed it to take root? Rethinking this line of a film historical imaginary, especially along the Korean cinema's recent regeneration, is a fruitful endeavor and opens up a few new perspectives in its own right and in, in relation to the film of my focus today in another country. But let me adjust the first part of my presentation to what French cinema means in South Korea more pointedly and for the moment. Initiated with the establishment of Institut Francais in Seoul in 1968, cinephilia in French movies came to full bloom in the 1970s and was consolidated throughout the 1980s with the birth of a generation called the Institut Francais Kids. The Institut Francais Kids, or the French Institute Kids, referred to a group born out of the theater salon in the Institut Francais in Seoul. At the time, the Institute, known for its universalist mission of promoting French cultural products overseas, had been a domestic hub for the screening of intellectual art house films that could not possibly be shown elsewhere due to censorship. Enthusiasts and would-be filmmakers gathered in Salle de Renoir as the screening room was called after the French film director Jean Renoir. Along with well-known directors and actors and actresses of the time as customary patrons. They were attempting to see the uncut versions uh, of moving images on screen let alone the rare foreign films that would have had no, otherwise no way of finding their way to local theaters. Such was the long queue to get tickets, which was genuinely incredibly long and overlaid if you look at the old pictures of the time, and also the screen was pretty much um, free. Uh, the Institute charged 20 Korean won for cleaning fee, 
when the average entrance fee for local cinema was somewhere between 300 to 400 won. So it cost pretty much nothing. So such was the long queue that surrounded the public square in front of the main royal palace of Gyeongbokgung, where the French institution was advantageously located. The police on horse was called as the authority considered the waiting audience as taking part in public demonstration. This was a time the government developed a policy of protectionism, attempting to regulate the licensing of film import and screen quotas and ideological imperatives. Under the authoritarian regime, cinephiles had no choice but to be satisfied with the domestic products which consisted of what we, did, what we would call um, low-class entertainment films, a choice many filmmakers considered a viable way to survive the enforcement of a film policy, on the one hand, and the so-called quality films to be officially recognized by the Motion Picture Promotion Corporation, MP MPPC in acronym, um, on the other. For the latter, Filmmakers were compelled to reveal the bright side of their social reality and highlight cultural tradition to school the public. Local companies seldom cared about censorship. Because film production was just a way to maintain their primary business, film importation. Releasing foreign features were afforded to only 12 companies um, through reorganization of import quotas and screen quotas in 1973. According to this change, basically, a company was required to make four domestic films to be able to earn an import quota. And the import quota would usually go to the most sought after Hollywood uh, products of the time, much to the complaints of the film industry and the dismay of film-hungry cinephiles. Hence the fervor with which the French movies were received by the frequenters of the, um, the French Institute. When they gathered to see the films from France, it was not because they knew France was one of the few countries outside the United States which actually possessed a continuous film culture thus boasting a film industry that goes back to the beginning of mm -hmm. cinema in 1985. Um, or each generation in France had produced the notable film directors of international stature. This realization came later, when the heavy brew of cine clubs were beginning to organize themselves after the initial stage of scopophilic enchantment of seeing cinematic images from far-flung territory which was so different from what we had with our home products. At Pei Chang Ho, one of the first generation of Korean filmmakers recalls, the French Institute was our film school and library that educated us about everything we needed to know about filmmaking. Another filmmaker from slightly younger generation, Jong Sung Il, who is also a notable film critic responsible for the founding of the film magazine Kino in the 1990s, remembers his first encounter with French films at the Institute. And I quote, I came to see Jew and Toby, Forbidden Games in English title, and then accidentally stumbled on Le Petit Soldat by Jean-Louis Godard. It was a revelation. People would stare at the camera, adjusting directly to it, the um, narrative resolutions were ambiguous and sometimes baffling. The editing was not following continuity in the way we were used to seeing in local cinemas. It was edgy, full of jump cuts and montages. They were so different from Korean, even Hong Kong and Hollywood movies. Um, end of the quote. The list of films shown at the Institute included far more than the films of Nouvelle Vague, though. As the Institute screened more than a thousand films during the first decade uh, since its establishment, extending from two screenings per day to six screenings per day due to increasing public demand. The French Institute showed films in its original French language with no dubbing. 
English subtitles were only occasionally provided. So cinephilia these Senate Club members became initiated into must have been a somewhat dandified ritual, as it literally meant sitting right through until the ending credit rolled up when most of them didn't know a word in French, and still being taken into the privileged moment of a segregated atmosphere of elevated pleasure and proselytization. The French language only policy, which could have been accused of chauvinism on the part of the French Institute, was counterpoised to a degree by the way the Institute had been receptive of the films of other nationality, including the American cinema. Classics like Citizen Kane was often shown and discussed at cinema clubs. In addition to this, the Institute gave opportunities to local, amateur, and student filmmakers to showcase their work. Kwak Jae-yong, one of the well-known filmmakers who made My Sassy Girl and many other box office hits, both in domestic and international markets, um, remembers how he first got into filmmaking. Um, how, um, remembers how he first got into filmmaking by entering into the student film exhibition held at the Institute and getting applauded for what he showed in the Salle de Renoir, full of cinephiles, whose love for cinema was encouraging enough, but a certain taste, cultivated through educating themselves at the Institute, made them, and I quote from Quark, the perfect audience. The most successful of these perfect audience has beyond the question been the formation of filmmakers whose work became known as Korean New Wave at the turn of millennium. As ardent cinephiles, these directors encompassed a broad range of cinema from classic French cinema to contemporary auteurs and were keen to incorporate these influences into local films. On the other hand, Local audience, for their part, were highly receptive to such an approach. South Korean experience, sorry, South Korea experienced a transition from military to civilian rule in the early 1990s, resulting in the newfound freedom of newfound freedom of expression. A newborn enthusiasm provided the local, mostly young directors with the chance to make films. In the wake of democratization. The renewal of Korean cinema owed much to political and economic climate changes, which not only enabled an opportunity to rediscover a type of social realism that had disappeared after the emergence of the military regime in 1961, but also heralded a more modern expression of contemporary life. So, let us finally turn to in another country, the film of my focus today, and to the way the film incorporates the intricacy of defining contemporary cinephilia in the age of globalized and transcultural film literacy. Uh, looking at the film in the past, I have set out a kind of hypothesis that the film and the circumstances around the making of it can be read as a, as a sort of two-way cinephilia. Um, in another country is a comedy of cultural difference and nuances, telling the story of a French woman visiting a small seaside town of Mohang in South Korea. The film was made possible by the encounter between Isabel Ruper, a French icon who has publicly endorsed Korean films in recent years, and the writer-director Hong sang soo With a distinctive investment in bringing French cinematic modernism to Korean screens. During the collaboration between the Korean auteur and the French icon that transcends their own national cinemas, I wanted to look at the film, or rather around the film, as a product of a two-way cinephilia, if I can um, call it that. The first cinephilia could be detected from without. The other cinephilia could be recognized from within.
But cinephilia from without is of course Ripper's love of Korean cinema, but also by implication. And I have already shown as well and how this um, her love call, as often called in Korean press, consistently mentioning that she is a fan of Korean cinema and she would like to be one day in a film directed by a Korean director, could be seen as representing French and European cinema's endorsement of Korean filmmakers of recent years. Now, the cinephilia from within, on the other hand, is what happens inside the film. And by that, I mean the Korean filmmaker Hong Sang Su's admiration of Isabel Ripper as an icon of French European cinema and how it is demonstrated, dramatized, tested in the film, and how it survives through a comedy of cultural clash and differences that is, another, that is in another country, a film featuring a French woman stranded in a very Korean setting. What I want to propose to think about when looking at a film like In Another Country is that we might consider the fact that a face of European art cinema, such as Ripper, proposed to perform in a Korean film, can be read as a reflection of how Europe now looks at Korean cinema as a new hunting ground of cinephilia. Much like the way French cinema once was for film-hungry Korean audiences of the past decades. Repair's attention as a sign of European interest in Korean films calls for a need to look at the film in another country beyond its textual analysis. External elements that exist outside film, such as auteur, stardom, and national cinema, can be useful in looking at the circumstances around the making of this film. What happens when a European film star like Repair performs in a Korean film made by the native author like Hong sang Su, especially when the film was tailored to feature the star as a central character at the background of a Korean setting. Can we see this encounter as an opportunity for aesthetic crossings between Hong's Korean authorism and Ripper's French stardom? And then, is it not a kind of cinephilia for the unknown territory of the other cinema that lies behind what motivated this collaboration? On these questions, I'm going to finish this presentation. A person not before telling you what I find most interesting in this film. For all those cinephilic saturations that have been going on in the encounter around the making of the film, and for all those film historical imaginaries that I have mentioned in the first part of this presentation, focusing on the Institut Francais in Seoul, which has been taking root in Korean love affair with French cinema. Home to film in another country is actually about the impossibility of truly loving and understanding the other, whether the relation be romantic or cinephilic. No matter how these, co these Korean men are attracted by and infatuate themselves with the French woman that Ripper represents, the entanglement is socially awkward, sexually frustrated, and only further revealing the selfishness of Korean men, of which you could say these are the director Hong's favorite themes. Perhaps they are taking a cue from what film scholar Kyung Hyun Kim observed in the remasculinization of Korean cinema, which is virtually the first scholarly book on Korean cinema published outside Korea and in English. And he talks about the allegories of a pathetic Korean man, which have been um, long, long been a fixture of Korean cinema, inflicting the historical wounds. Korean society could not have an opportunity to treat properly under the past regimes. So, no matter how hard these men sought after repair, they are nowhere near her in the end, and repair is left alone. In the same way, how repair's character tries to find the lighthouse, 
persistently in each episode of the film, but nobody in the local community knows where it is, or even if it does exist. Even the lifeguard doesn't know where exactly the lighthouse is. These are all hilariously funny, but also opens up spaces for other elements of a pleasure to come in, such as chance encounters and big, <coughs> unexpected moments of intimacy. If you have a chance to see the film, you will understand what I mean by that. But thank you. Thank you.